Welcome back to Morning Joe. The New York Times' Bob Herbert is still with us, along with Pat Buchanan in Washington. And joining the table right now, the editor-in-chief of The Daily Beast and Newsweek, Tina Brown. Tina, good to okay. have you back. Nice to see you. A lot going on, what but Tina, obviously, Afghanistan, we've talked about it here for some time. It sounds like the debate is heating up in Washington. Finally, yeah. finally, people asking questions. Well, it is. It really is time. And, uh, you know, with the world exploding as it is, I have to say that Obama does have the worst inbox of any president maybe in history. He really he has does. I mean, it's a, but the thing is... It's it's almost like the length of time it takes to make a decision, and then it seems like we're not even confident that it's the right decision. You know, the, the Afghanistan surge, I still think, probably was a mistake. Um, right. And now we're seeing this debate, which really should have been capturing us more at the time and thereafter, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, you know, uh, the Afghanistan, uh, we want to push it to the front of the table now. We really do. We They're have to now decide to what we're going to do. Yeah, the no. House voted down the bill to withdraw right. troops by the end of the year. But the, the question and the controversy was, how did it even get to there? Well, I think the, it's obvious, actually. People are beginning to wear thin on this. No doubt about and it. But it is hard to push it to the, uh, the front. Right. Uh, when you have so much up front. Exactly. Obviously, Japan and Mika yesterday, the United Nations Security Big Council news. voting to take action on Libya. Big right. news. Let's start there. The Libyan government closed its airspace to all traffic today in reaction to that U.N. resolution authorizing the use of force and a no-fly zone over the country. American officials say attempts to ground Muammar Gaddafi's forces could begin by Sunday or Monday with the use of jet fighters, bombers, and surveillance aircraft. Meanwhile, Gaddafi is promising to respond harshly to any U.N.-sponsored attack, saying he doesn't acknowledge its resolutions. The chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court says that if Gaddafi goes ahead with his threat to attack Benghazi, it would constitute a war crime. And the question, the question is, uh, is it too little, too late? Max Hastings, writing in the Financial Times, says this. Grown-up governments do not indulge in emotional lunges, committing war planes, as if sending a donation to Oxfam. Pat, is it too little, too late in Libya? You know, it, I don't know that it is, Joe, but I do know this, that the, I believe generally the Congress of the United States has got to debate this weekend whether or not to give Barack Obama the authority to take us to war against Libya, because that's what the U.N. has authorized, a war on Libya. But, Joe, a quick point. Our friend Haley Barber has raised the issue of Afghanistan and raised the issue of cutting Pentagon spending out there in Iowa. So this all may be on the table in the 2012 Republican primary. I think it may, Pat. Absolutely. I think I think there is a big opening for a conservative that comes out and says we can't continue uh, being basically the world's 911. Bob Herbert, is it too little too late in Libya, or did the president do what some of us, I think, think agreed with well, which he, says, waited, can... waited for the for collective action to come along waited for collective action um, I think the president played it right uh, I do too and it's much too early to say it's uh, too little too late I, I think that we uh, needed to be part of this uh, no-fly zone effort uh, for all we know it may be paying dividends um, already um, you have to be very careful about getting immersed in something that you can't extricate yourself from. Right. But I don't think the United States could just sit passively by and watch Gaddafi just go in and start mowing Tina. down people. Well, I've been in favor of, of, of doing it earlier, I have to say. Only, uh, but I think it's an agony for Obama for the reasons that we know, which is obviously you can't get embroiled in another war. But at the same time, you know, the, the, the moral recoil of seeing right. this, these, these rebels left right. to, to, to twist in the wind. And I think that the long-term effects on the Arab street of having America look as if, you know, once again, you know, it, it, it did business with the, the terrible Gaddafi. Then it kind of went out there and made hypocritical statements about freedom, then left them to twist in the wind. Right. I don't see how it by says the, the way, he cannot do this. Tina, right. that's, that's a discussion we're not yeah. having right now. Great Britain, much to, to, to more of a degree than they want to admit, uh, played ball with Gaddafi over oil, the same with the United States, obscenely the same so. with Scotland. Obscenely so. It no, was I mean, obscene. I absolutely agree. And I just wonder if that did not play into the considerations here, mm -hmm. uh, at least of our government. Wow. Well, definitely, and I certainly think it's played in the consideration of David Cameron, who I think knows that, you know, the Labour government really did cheesy stuff with the Gaddafi government. And also, one of the things I think we're seeing is how the son, you know, Saif Gaddafi, who everybody, you know, in this kind of international community power players were all kind of seeing as this kind of guy, just 
because he had cool suits and had right. an American sort of kind of education, as if he was a guy who, you know, somehow was different from his father. But what we're seeing is he is as tyrannical and bloodthirsty as his father, and just because, you know, he looks Western makes absolutely no difference. And I yeah. think that was also obscene, what you saw happening in London at certain circles. He was very much accepted. And as you say, we have to be careful. If this is a moral question, if we're doing it because it's the right thing to do, just with the no-fly zone, it will also become a moral question when Gaddafi starts going after the rebels on the ground. If he goes into Benghazi without airplanes and starts shooting and killing innocents and killing uh, rebel forces there, what do we do then? Is this a slippery slope? If we've committed morally to this, how far do you go with it? But we did no commit joke. morally to this. Uh, Pat Buchanan, mm -hmm. the president said he had to go. The president was very clear about that. Doesn't that mean right. we're in? No, the president of the United States <laughs> cannot just say somebody's got to go and then take us to war. Right. He's got to have Congress behind him. But let me say this. Willie's exactly right. In for a dime, in for a dollar. If we go and attack Libya, and, and, and we're going to have to go in and finish him and kill him. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what's our purpose? Just to have them have a fair fight? So I think before we walk into this war, we ought to know how we're going to end it and win it, and then how we're going to get out of there. And that's why I think, uh, again, the Congress has got to be on board here. Well, yeah, I, here's where I agree with Pat. Um, you know, I'm in favor of the no-fly zone. The United States has to be a part of that. The president has said Gaddafi has to go. But our concept of warfare has changed so that now we allow ourselves to get into these endless wars. They go on, you know, Afghanistan more than a decade now. And it used to be that if you, if you went to war, the idea was to overwhelm the enemy and to get it over with as quickly as possible. So we need to decide on our own concept concepts of warfare going forward now. And the, the meaning of success, the definition exactly of winning. Exactly right. Because there isn't one, by the way, in Afghanistan. Right. Yeah. It does have a cloud, though, in a sense, when things are the right and wrong things to do. It's almost like there's so much information out there now about these other failed, you know, these other Which was one of the problems with the Iraq things. war. You know, it, it got all twisted up, because sometimes, right. obviously, there are reasons to go to war, Absolutely. and you should go to war yeah. for, obviously, the right reasons. All right, let's move now to the other big story, mm -hmm. a top Japanese official now acknowledging his government is overwhelmed by the country's earthquake, tsunami, and resulting nuclear crisis that comes as the country's chief cabinet secretary reaches out to the U.S. for help in trying to stabilize the stricken Fukushima nuclear plant. This morning, the severity rating of the crisis was also raised from four to five on a scale of one to seven, with seven being the worst. In a possible setback, smoke rose once again today from one of the plant's buildings as Crews work to reconnect power to critical cooling systems. According to Japanese officials, the complex's third unit is their main priority since water there is believed to be dangerously low, meaning fuel rods could overheat and emit dangerous radioactive material. For now, though, the Japanese government has no plans to expand its mandatory 13-mile exclusion zone around the plant. And the chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission is now warning that the crisis in Japan could take days and possibly weeks to get under control. At the White House yesterday, President Obama tried to reassure the American public that the risk of radiation from Japan reaching American soil is negligible. We do not expect harmful levels of radiation to reach the West Coast, Hawaii, Alaska, or U.S. territories in the Pacific. That is the judgment of our Nuclear Regulatory Commission and many other experts. The president's remarks came after he paid an unannounced visit to the Japanese embassy in Washington yesterday where he signed a condolence book for the victims of the earthquake and tsunami. Tina Brown, uh, right as this crisis began, Mark Halpern, uh, he writes notes every day for the Morning Joe team, and he said... From day one, the greatest challenge is going to be Japan's government breaking its long tradition of not being forthright, not being honest Absolutely. with its people and the world. Now, this was before you could have criticized them for anything, but Mark saw it coming. I guess a lot of people saw it. There is something genetically wrong with politicians 
uh, in, in the, these governments that <clears throat> just can't come forward and tell the truth. It's absolutely true. And interesting enough, we have uh, a DNA. post on the, DN, uh, on the Daily Beast this morning, actually, about an interview with a guy you know, who's in Japan. Uh, we, our writer, Joan Buck, actually asked him, he's in, he's, he's in the food business, like what America could do. And he sends back a very different picture. He says, within a 30-kilometer radius around the plants, the government has instructed the refugees to stay sealed indoors. However, the government isn't sending in food and fuel to these households, and these refugees centers. He says they're being exposed. He said one government official made a historical statement accusing private companies of not going to the 30-kilometer area voluntarily. But the people are just trapped in their houses. There's no food. And there's a sense, uh, this writer says, of not wanting to criticize the government because that feeling in Japan is so in intensely imbued that, you know, you have to stay together. You don't want it's to show that. It's imbued in their culture. It's imbued in their We're culture. And so that, as a matter of fact, the government are doing really badly right now. But yeah. nobody what, wants what, to criticize what is, it. Why well, well, the Japanese thing, culture? You know, a lot of us are in the business of criticizing our own government, but sometimes the United States does things right. And when there's a crisis of, of this sort in, in the United States, Americans can feel comfortable that the government is, is not lying to them, them. That, the, that the government is on your side, yeah, and uh, not deliberately withholding information that is going to be life-threatening to people and, and, and that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a big deal. The, the culture and the tradition in um, Japan is different, and you pay a price for it. Uh, there are pros and cons. I mean, I think the, the, pro, the, the cons overwhelmingly overwhelm the, the pros in this case. Right. But one of the pros is that the Japanese people tend to pull uh, together, that they're calm, right. that you don't have looting and rioting and that sort of thing. But you pay a price. Yeah. yeah. This writer also says America should be putting pressure. You know, should, we should be very critical to help the people of Japan because as they're not being able to do it, we have to. Well, it's also interesting to watch the American governor, government defer to the Japanese government for a while. They listened, okay, th you know, 13 kilometers away, and finally they said, enough. No, we're right, exactly. 50 miles, yeah. there's the new radius, here. we're stepping in. We're, we're, yeah, Willie's exactly right, uh, Pat. Uh, you have the Japanese government saying, if you're outside of the 12-mile radius of this nuclear plant where there could be three to four meltdowns going on, just, just hang out. Just, <laughs> 13 miles is fine, whereas the United States won't even allow their military personnel to get within 50 miles without special, uh, special permission. Well, exactly. You know, the United States is very different. We have almost an adversary culture here. But there's Joe. It's very ethno-national. It's almost tribal. It's familial. And they have an enormous degree of social capital. In other words, you don't let the family problems out in public. And this is a real characteristic of the Japanese, utterly different from what we have. Understandable, it can give them real problems such as they've got now. But I agree with Mr. Herbert here that uh, the Americans have a much better way of it. This Our openness, our back and forth, our criticism and the rest of it, I think is much more beneficial if you're going to try to deal with this thing honest, up front, and get it out. And, of mm. course, the exception, of course, Mika, uh, for the United States was Katrina, but, but, well, but, that but within, but within two spur. days, right, but within two days, George W. Bush was savaged, savaged. Mm -hmm. His ratings mm -hmm. dropped, and, and, you know, people always tried to blame his collapse in the polls on, uh, on, on Iraq and other issues. It was but his yeah. polls plummeted to the low 30s, and he never recovered because, because we Americans have an adversarial that. culture. That's exactly right. You're right. exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And an open sense of communication and mm -hmm. a dialogue, at least compared. And look at what, the, what it was like in this country um, when 9-11 occurred. Yeah. I mean, it, you, you can still yeah. get chills thinking about what yeah. went on at that But it time. is like a horrific sort of science fiction movie to think that people are, tra you know, are trapped in their homes, being told oh. that they can't go out, but they have nothing to eat, and they and have no gas to, to get out of their cars and escape, and they're also being pressured to kind of not leave. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a horrendous and situation. And the worry is, when they are told to leave, it will be too late. Right. Right because the you know, exposure will be, the levels will be too high, mm. as the American government believes. Coming up, actor Bradley Cooper will join us live on the set. Up next, the moderator of Meet the Press, David Gregory, is here with a preview of this weekend's guests.